Tonight we're going to finish our study through the book of Ephesians by uh, coming into chapter 6. Last week we intended to take the first nine verses of chapter 6, but as you might imagine is common, we, we really got into the detail of this great passage on marriage that's found at the end of Ephesians chapter 5. But it's very important that you understand the flow of Paul's thought. He's speaking of the broader idea of how we walk in the light, how we walk in this Christian life in a way that's worthy of God, in a way that's pleasing to God. And so in verse 15 of chapter 5, he speaks of this kind of of walk that we're to have, we're to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, uh, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Uh, We're supposed to be smart in verse 17. Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. This is just marks of a godly walk. Then in verse 18, he brings up the idea of being filled with the Spirit, which is a very important idea that we dealt with previously. And so he deals with this idea of of the spirit-filled life as being a mark of this walk with God. But then he also brings up in verse 21 this idea of submission and its place in the walk of God. And we talked about that, what it means to submit to one another in the fear of God, and how really this was a great call from the Apostle Paul, really the Holy Spirit speaking through him, that we would all have this sort of team mentality in the body of Christ, where we work together as a body, as a team, as a whole. But then, beginning at verse 22, he takes this idea of submission and speaks about it in the context of a place where it has special application, not only the general application of the body of Christ, as he mentioned in verse 21, but the special application in marriage. But he can't bring up the duty of the wife to submit without also bringing up the responsibility of the husband to really view the marriage relationship in the proper terms of oneness and unity and sacrificial love. And so that's where we get this great passage. But what I'm trying to get at is he he approached it through the context of submission. That's why it's important to understand that when we come to verse 1 of chapter 6. Because there he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. See, the command here is very simple, but understand the context. Paul spoke about submission in a very general sense. Then he said, okay, uh, submission brings up the matter of marriage. And now he's saying submission also brings up the matter of the parent-child relationship. And just like he addressed wives first because of the context of submission, so he's going to address children first in the parent-child relationship because he's speaking in the broader theme of submission. But the command is very simple. Children are to obey their parents. This not only means that children have the responsibility to obey, but it also means that parents have the responsibility to teach their children obedience. And of course, this is one of the most important jobs for a parent. Parents need to understand this. You don't need to teach your child how to disobey. They inherit that, right? Nobody has to have little disobedience lessons for the child. They have inherited that as a son of Adam or as a daughter of Eve. But yet obedience must be taught. And I would say that this is really essential and and, and important in laying a foundation for a godly life to come. Because if a child can be taught properly how to obey their parents, not in an oppressive way, not in in, in an authoritarian kind of way, but in a proper sense, then the groundwork is laid in that child's life for them to obey God properly. And this is what all of a parent's discipline for a child must come to. Disobedience must be punished so that obedience can be learned. And so he says, Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now again, the apostle is giving two reasons for the child to obey the parents. First, obey in the Lord. Don't you find that to be very similar to what he said in verse 22 of chapter 5? Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. He's talking to the children. He's saying, this is part of your Christian obedience. It's part of the walk that God has called you to. And then the second reason is, right there in verse 2 as well, excuse me, pardon me, verse 1, he says, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. It's just right. Now people can tell. If, if, if children don't obey and show a proper respect towards parents, 
it lays the groundwork for what we might call complete anarchy in society to where uh, there is no idea of submission and proper authority. And then Paul goes on to point out that this is the first commandment with a promise. He's reinforcing this idea with a reference back to Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16, where God promised to bless the obedient child. Now, just as much as in the marriage passage, he first addressed the wives, then he brought up the responsibility of the husband. So first he addressed the child, and now what would you expect? Now he's going to address the responsibility of the parent. Look at verse 4. And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Now I have to say, th this is absolutely amazing. We have to understand the thinking of the ancient world, especially the Roman world. Under Roman law, now I just want to say, not only under Roman law, it was ancient custom in the world, but specifically under Roman law, a father had absolute power over his children. A, a father could kill or murder his own child, son or daughter, and the law could say nothing about it. Literally, the parent had the power of life and death legally over their children in the ancient world and in particular in the Roman world. Don't you think it's wonderful that right here at this place, the Apostle Paul, speaking by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, no, no, parent, you don't have this absolute right. You're not even to provoke your children to wrath. You're to bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. This doesn't mean merely scolding your children. It means to train them and to admonishment. You're to encourage them. You're to rebuke them. And you're to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Now, I have to say, we're moving through this section more quickly than I would like to. There's a lot more for us to validly spend time here on, but we've got a powerhouse packed passage here at the end where it speaks about the spiritual warfare that we're involved in. So we're going to move right on to verse 5, where first he spoke about submission, general context, then specific, marriage, specific, uh, parent and child. Now, specific, specific, slave and master, verse 5. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. Now, I want you to notice here, he says something absolutely revolutionary there in verse 5, because here he's addressing slaves, servants in the ancient world. And there in verse 5, he says, Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and sincerity, as to Christ. You, you, you could sort of cut out the middle part of that sentence if you wanted to, and just cut to this. Bond servants, be obedient as to Christ. Now, those words, as to Christ, completely change our whole perspective. It, it makes that slave realize that their obedience was not just to their master because he was a slave, but their obedience was to Jesus Christ. I want you to notice, and this is what's really significant and exciting to see this. Do you see the structure of this? Submission in general, then specifically submission in marriage, submission in the parent-child relationship, now submission in the master-slave relationship. The principles remain the same throughout. Are any of these an absolute command to submission? No. No. If your master commands you to sin, are you to do it? No. It's not an absolute call to submission. Now, we agree it's a very high command to submission, but it's not absolute we also notice that in each one of these same, each one of these three spheres of submission that Paul mentions, the idea is presented that they're to do it as to Christ, as to the Lord, as part of their Christian obedience. Now, might I say this as well? Is I think that these concepts are very transferable to us today. Because even though we don't have the institution of slavery in the world today, as they had in the ancient world that Paul lived in, nevertheless, we still have the employer-employee relationship, the, the boss and the worker relationship. And in some ways, it, it, it's much the same. It might be the same at your job. Maybe your boss treats you like a slave. Maybe that's the situation. Or it may just be that you need to realize 
that in many ways we misunderstand the institution of slavery in the ancient world. So when we look here in verse 5, and he's speaking about this idea of bond servants being obedient as to Christ, if we apply this to our own relationship in our workplace, it can absolutely revolutionize our perspective as workers. It reminds us that our work can be done and should be done as if we're working for Jesus, because we actually are. I mean, do you really understand that? How that changes everything for you. Whatever job you're giving, you know, here at the Bible College, we give the students practical work assignments. And, you know, let's face it, some of the jobs they do are, are pretty much just jobs full of drudgery. You know, go out and sweep the street. Go out and, you know, do the dishes. Go out and do the same thing you've done every day for the last four months. You know, a lot of the jobs aren't particularly a lot of fun. They're just kind of, they're not really bold, exciting jobs. They're just jobs. They're just chores. There's, there's not much to really say, wow, let's get excited about many of these duties that the students have to do. But you have to admit, if you really understood with the perspective, if Jesus came up to me and asked me to sweep the street, I would be excited about doing it. I mean, isn't that just human nature? You'd say, yes, I want to sweep that street and I'd be excited about doing it because I get to do it unto Christ. It's his, it's his job and I'd do it the best I can and you'd probably whistle while you worked and you'd be very excited about the whole job and everything. Well, I mean, really, it's not a psychological mind game for you to say, I am doing this for Jesus. In point of fact, that's what you are doing, aren't you? Your whole life is lived unto Jesus Christ. And so this is just the fact of the matter. Bond servants, be obedient. And then as he says there at the end of verse 5, as to Christ. But then he goes on to verse 6, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. I love that term, eye service. It means to serve just to be seen. You know, that's the guy who when, when his supervisor is around, oh, he's working hard and doing, as soon as the supervisor leaves, he takes a break, right? That's eye service, isn't it? I'll work hard when I'm being watched. But as soon as I'm not being watched, I have no desire to work hard anymore. Now, what does that say? That, that means your work is being done completely for the wrong motive. But again, I want to emphasize, we see this common connection of these principles of submission as doing these things as unto the Lord. Now, again, because admittedly, we're hurrying through this section. So much more can be said. Let's just take a look at verse 9 before we go in to verse 10, where he says in verse 9, and you masters do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Well, again, I want you to understand that just as much as it was a radical thing for Paul to say to the husbands of the ancient world, you treat your wife right. Just as much as it was a radical thing for him to address the fathers in the ancient world and say, you treat your children right. So it is a radical thing for him to speak to the masters of these slaves and say, you have a responsibility to treat them right. You know, I have to say that many people wonder why the New Testament does not speak out against slavery uh, more strongly. Why it doesn't make a protest movement. Why there weren't marches in the streets against slavery, you know, under Christians in the ancient Roman Empire and all the rest. And, and the bottom line is just this. I can say without hesitation that it was Christianity that, that ruined the institution of slavery in the Roman Empire. Because as Christianity began to spread and congregations began to be filled with slaves and their masters, it became very hard for a person to say, you're my brother in Christ and you're also my slave. This sort of, if I could use a turn of speech here, just a, it, it freaked them out in the Roman Empire that slaves and masters would go to the same church together. Because that was absolutely forbidden for, for these two different classes to mix. And what would be even stranger? is sometimes, not, it wasn't so unusual for this to happen, sometimes you would go to a church and a slave would be an elder in the church and his master would have to be under his authority in the church. And, and sort of they go to church and the tables would be turned, so to speak. But you know how it is when, when the person is, is, is your brother in Christ, you may say, well, look, I, you're still my slave. You still have this responsibility to serve, but I can't treat you the way that I treated you before. I have to treat you the way that Paul's talking about here. I have to remember that I have a master in heaven. It, it made the institution of slavery much more humane, Christianity did, and, of course, it eventually destroyed it. It eventually ruined it. 
So anyway, uh, moving on now to verse 10. And of course, verse 10 is a passage of scripture that I think is probably familiar to most of you. If it's not familiar to you, it should be familiar to you because it speaks very powerfully about one of these principles of, uh, of well, this principle of spiritual warfare. It's really amazing, this book of Ephesians. It has this this, this amazing uh, portion in the first couple of chapters where Paul just soars us up to the heavenly places where we see our standing with Jesus Christ. And I mean, in some of the most powerful and poetic and, and beautiful language found in the Bible, Paul speaks to us. But, but it also has within it, if you want to take a look at, at chapter 5, it also has within one of the most eloquent and, and, and powerful expressions of the marital relationship and what it means in Jesus Christ. And then now coming to chapter 6, beginning at verse 10, it has one of the most powerful and, and succinct expressions of what spiritual warfare, what Christian conflict is all about. And so let's just jump into it here. Verse 10, he says, finally, my brethren. Now again, finally, it's coming at the end of the letter, right? We should remember that. What Paul says in verse 10 following, it comes at the end of the letter, a letter that Paul has carefully used to establish our place in Jesus Christ and the basics of the Christian walk. He said, listen, you're, you've got to walk to live before God. You, you, you do this walk in light of all that God has done for you. you. You do this walk in light of the glorious standing that you have as a child of God. You do this walk in light of the great plan of the ages that God has made you part of. You, you, you do this walk in light of the plan for Christian maturity and growth that he gives you. You, you. you do it in light of the conduct that God calls every believer to live in. And you do it in light of the filling of the Spirit and the walk in the Spirit and all of that. In light of all that. Okay, I've spoken to you about all of that. Now, finally, there's a battle that you have to fight in your Christian life. It, it almost seems very appropriate, very fitting that Paul saves us at the end, right? I mean, it's almost he paints this beautiful picture of the, of the Christian life and he shows how great it is, how wonderful it is, and what our responsibilities are and what God has done for us and all of it. And just this beautiful picture. And then at the end of it all, you have a battle to fight. This isn't given, the Christian life isn't given to you as a coffee table book that you sit back and you thumb through the pages. Oh, isn't it wonderful? No, it's something you have to go out and you live, you engage in. There's a battle to it. And therefore he says here, finally, my brethren, verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, literally, what Paul wrote in the ancient Greek language is this. Literally, he said, strengthen yourselves in the Lord. He probably took the idea from 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6, where it says that David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Now, I have to say, this whole passage, the extended passage here about spiritual warfare, really presents two essential components. There's two essential, I would call them pillars to the idea of spiritual warfare. And you know, if you've got a structure held up by two pillars, you can't take one of them away, right? And so the two pillars, I would call them, of spiritual warfare are these principles. The first is that you must be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Secondly, you must put on the whole armor of God. And Paul will explain that shortly. The two of them are essential. And I have to say, a lot of teaching on Christian spiritual warfare neglects the first pillar. They neglect this idea of being strong in the Lord and in the power of the might, but it's absolutely essential. We can't just jump over and, oh, tell me about the armor. I love the swords and the helmets and the breastplates and all of that. Tell me about the armor. That's wonderful to talk about. And it is wonderful. But you better start with being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. If you don't begin there, you can't use the armor. You think of a soldier, right? He's given the best armor, right? He's got the vest, he's got the helmet, he's got all the padding, he's got all the weapons. Man, he's outfitted completely, but he's a, the typical, as you would say, the 98-pound weakling, and he can hardly stand up under it all, right? He doesn't have any strength. So what's the first thing that they do for the soldier? Not that I would know. I mean, I've never been in the military service. I've seen movies, so I think I know about it just from seeing movies. But supposedly, the first thing they want to do, one of the first, they put you in basic training, don't they? They put you through several weeks, months of training, and, and it, it's, it's training for a lot of them. It's training you psychologically. It's training you in the group mentality. It's training you all those things you need to be as a soldier. But what's the emphasis there? It's physical conditioning because they know what, what's the use of giving you all the armor, all the weapons, if you don't have any strength to use them with. Therefore, if you want to be an effective spiritual warrior, so to speak, the first thing you need to do is you need to be strong in the Lord, but no, strong in him and in the power of his might. What Paul's pointing you to is a strength that is not within yourself. 
You, you don't get this by sitting down in a room and crossing your legs and gritting your teeth and flexing your muscles and saying, I'm getting stronger and stronger and stronger in Jesus. Yes, no. It's not strength that comes from within you. It, you're not your own resource for this. You're strong in the Lord. You're strong in the power of his might, not your own. And so this is a very, very important principle. We have to get this strength in our Christian life. We have to cling to this strength. And might I say, we have to avoid things that waste our strength. I, I think of many Christians who probably, you know, yes, they, they understand this principle. Yes, I need to be connected to the Lord. Yes, I need his strength. And, and so they say, yes, I want to connect to the Lord in my daily walk with God. Yes, I want to connect to the Lord in worshiping with other believers and hearing the word of God. And, and you might say, so to speak, that strength is coming into their spiritual life. But you know what the problem is? Is that they're wasting it. They waste it. Their life is filled with compromises. Their life is filled with too much activity, too much craziness, and too many uh, just self-focused things. And it's as if this, this water is being poured into a bucket, but the bucket has holes. And so it's all being wasted. And so no, we say, no, nah, I need your might. I need your strength, Lord. I, I, I want to be strong in the power of your might. I, I need this for the spiritual warfare. I need this for the battle that I'm in as a Christian. So having said that, I don't know, is that enough about verse 10? I think we really need to grab onto this. I, I think we need to balance this out. In the balance I have, you have verse 10, you know, on one side of the scale, and it's just as heavy as the other verses we're going to take a look at. It really is. You have to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. But then after that, what do you do? Well, you have to have the whole armor of God. Look at verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, the armor of God will be explained more fully in the next passage. But the emphasis here in verse 11 is on the whole armor of God. And that's the emphasis in the Greek construction here. God gives the believer a full set of equipment. He sends us out with all we need to fight the battle. Every once in a while you hear it either in modern day uh, accounts or in, in history, you know, maybe uh, from, you know, wars in the last century or wars in ancient history. You, you read these stories about soldiers being sent out into battle without the right equipment, right? They're sent out to battle in the snow, but they have no snow or cold weather equipment. They're set out to fight with their rifles, but there's no bullets for their rifles. You know, this idea, sending the soldier out to fight this battle, but he isn't equipped. He doesn't have what he needs to fight. And you read that and you go, man, that's terrible, isn't it? Wouldn't it be terrible? You're pushed out into the battle, but you don't have the things you need to fight it. What Paul's trying to tell you is God never does that with us. God will never push you out into the battle without making available to you all the armor you need. You can put on the whole or the complete armor of God. I think it's very interesting that this ancient Greek word for armor is used in only one other place in the New Testament. You know where it's used? It's used in Luke chapter 11 where Jesus spoke of the strong man who was fully armed but was stripped of his armor when a stronger one came. And the idea is that your enemy has armor, and God has given you armor to, so to speak, counter your enemy. So put on the whole armor, and I love this, the whole armor of God. I'm so happy he didn't say the whole armor of David. That would be rough, wouldn't it? If I had to supply my own armor? What does it mean that it's the whole armor of God? I think it means it in two senses. First of all, it's the whole armor of God in that one, it is from him, right? He gave it to you, right? He says, here, here's some armor. You put it on, it's from him. But I tell you, there's an even more precious sense in which this is the armor of God. It is the armor of God in that it is his armor. Did you know that the Lord himself wears armor? What, you, you don't believe me? Keep your finger here. Turn back to Isaiah chapter 59, Verse 17. Matter of fact, I think that Paul had this passage in mind when, when he was composing this exhortation to the Ephesians and to us. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 17, speaks really eloquently about the Lord's armor. See it here, verse 17. For he put on a righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of for, vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. 
Don't you see how Paul had this in mind when he was composing this passage? And so you see how precious it is for him to put on the whole armor of God. It's as if God in heaven says, here, you take my armor. You can fight with my armor. And then why? Why do we put on this whole armor? It says right there in verse 11. So that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We express the strength we have. Okay, think of this. Here's the strong soldier, right? He's strong in the Lord and the power of his might. He's fully equipped. He's got all the armor he needs on. What does he do with it? He stands against the wiles of the devil. In other words, the idea is that Satan has a strategy. He has a deception. He has a plan that he wants to implement. And and because we're strong, because we have the whole armor of God, we stand against it and we prevent it. The idea in verse 11 is mainly defensive. Paul will deal with the offensive later, but it's mainly defensive, the idea there in verse 11. Now, going on to verse 12, he's introduced the idea of being strong in the Lord and the idea of the whole armor of God. Now he's going to describe the dynamic of spiritual warfare in verse 12, where he says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, I think this is absolutely interesting here. Take another look at verse 12. Is verse 12 an invitation to enter into spiritual warfare? I don't regard it as such. I do not regard verse 12 as an invitation to enter spiritual warfare. It is instead a declaration of fact. You're in it. Listen, I don't have to tell you to enter into spiritual warfare. You're in it. Now, maybe you're, well, I, I should be careful of my spirit. I was going to say, maybe you're so dumb, but I would just say the same to myself. Maybe we're so misguided that we don't recognize we're in spiritual warfare and we're just getting beat silly all the time. But, you know, I don't have to tell you to enter into it. You're in it. You're a child of God. You're following after his faith. You're in it. Hello, welcome to the warfare. Here you are. You're in it, whether you like it or not. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. You're in it. You are in a spiritual battle. If you are ignorant of the fact, if you ignore the fact, you're probably not winning that battle. And then he says here, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. The fact that our real battle is not against flesh and blood is lost upon many Christians. They, they seem to put all their energy, all their effort into flesh and blood. Uh, Paul's idea here is much the same as what he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. Listen to this carefully. He said, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Now, doesn't that sound great? I mean, it sounds like the same idea. And so what do we fight against? Not against flesh and blood, but against, as he says here, principalities, powers, the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Paul uses a variety of terms to refer to our spiritual enemies. We should regard them because the idea here seems to be that they are on many different levels and of many different ranks. And I don't really understand it. Now, you understand how in the military, you know, you have the general, and then you have the colonel, and then you have the major, and then, you know, you have your different levels of rank, right? Apparently, in some way that we don't fully understand, these are spiritual ranks of wickedness. And I can't tell you if a power is greater than a principality or where it connects to the ruler of the darkness of this age or these different ranks. I don't think it's really important. I think what Paul wants us to understand is that they're organized against you. They have an organization, they have a chain of authority, and they have one goal. And that goal is to knock the Christian down from their place of standing. That's what the Christian warfare is about. To combat the wiles of the devil, right? That's what he said in verse 11. At the end of the day, it's completely irrelevant. I don't want anybody to think that your job in spiritual warfare is to now are you a principality or a power? Maybe you're a ruler of the darkness of this age. I'm not real. Maybe you're a spiritual host of wickedness. I don't know. It's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. They're all part of a spiritual army that's organized and established into ranks. 
under the evil headship of Satan, the devil who comes against us with all of their wiles. Now, we've been introduced to this idea of principalities and powers and angelic beings before in the book of Ephesians. There's really no need to go into it in more depth other than just to say that these represent angelic beings who have been unfaithful to God and are now uh, in some sort of organized rebellion against God, which might I say that God has allowed for his good purpose. Nobody should think for a moment that God is somehow struggling in this battle against principalities and powers. You know, and maybe someday God will get enough resources, enough strength, enough might to defeat this. This isn't like, you know, Star Wars. It's not the yin and the yang. It's not the good part of the force and the dark side of the force. It's not that. We may struggle against these principalities and powers, but God allows them because at the end of it all, they serve his greater purpose. Now, I know, I know you may have a problem with it. You say, how could you do this, God? How, how could you allow Satan to do things, horrible things, and yet you're going to tell me that somehow it serves your greater purpose? I don't understand that, God. Well, I have to tell you, too, I don't completely understand it. And I, I may not be able to explain it in your specific situation, but I do know that perhaps the ultimate example of that principle is clear to all of us. Was there ever a more wicked act that took place on this earth that when a man was possessed by Satan and when he betrayed the Son of God, and then the Son of God was crucified by a cooperative effort from both Jew and Gentile and nailed on a cross. And when he died, people laughed. Is there anything worse than that in all of human history? That the totally sinless, pure Son of God was treated this way? And that you and I look at it and we say, that's the glory of our salvation. God, you use that. Now, in the same way, after the same fashion, I can't explain all the ways that, that, that God has allowed principalities and powers and all the rest of them to do their thing in this world. I know he could stop them in a moment. He could stop them with a thought from his mind. But yet, they serve his greater purpose, and, and, and we should be on the winning side of that battle in our own life. In, in any regard, now verse 13. It says, therefore, therefore, in light of all this opposition that you have, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now, Paul introduced the idea of the whole armor of God back in Ephesians 6.11. And in the following passage, he's going to detail the specific items related to the armor of God. Here, don't miss verse 13. Here in verse 13, he simply tells us what the main purpose of spiritual warfare and the armor of God is. Do you understand what it's there for? It's so that you can do something, so that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. I'm going to say something, and it might be controversial, and who knows, maybe if I teach on this in another couple months, I might tell you something different. But I'm just going to tell you how I see it tonight, right now at this time. I see it that many Christians have a wrong idea about spiritual warfare. They picture the Christian army as assaulting the kingdom of hell and sort of like we're out on patrol against demons and spiritual enemies, right? I mean, that's what an army does, right? There's bad guys out there. And so we get into our vehicles and we drive around with the machine guns and we look for bad guys and hunt them down. And much of this is based on a misunderstanding of Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, where Jesus said, And I say to you that you're Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And some people take from that idea that, that well, you know, as the church were to be bombarding the gates of hell, and there we are. And, and listen, part of that, I don't mean to criticize it. I, I, I t let's have an active understanding of these. Let's have sort of this aggressive mentality in the Christian life. That's great. Instead, though, I think what that passage is really speaking about is that the gates of Hades, well, in the ancient world, the city council, the judges, the city leadership gathered together at the gates of the city. It's the place where the city life was planned and organized and strategy. But when Jesus spoke of the gates of Hades, he meant that no satanic strategy, no plot from hell would ever ultimately succeed against the church. 
Let me suggest to you a different perspective on spiritual warfare. Instead of picturing the army of the church seeking out and attacking some kind of demonic fortress somewhere, I think we're to have the idea that Jesus illustrated in his ministry. Jesus didn't patrol around looking for demons to conquer. That would almost be allowing demons to set the agenda for his ministry. Instead, what did Jesus do? Jesus knew what God the Father wanted him to do. And he set out and he goes, I'm going to do it. Now, as he set himself out to do what God wanted him to do, uh, demonic powers would come and try to oppose him or resist him or shake him from that. And what would Jesus do it? Jesus said, forget it. I'm going to conquer it. Every time satanic opposition raised itself, Jesus stood against it and he was not moved. So this is, the, this is the, the image I want you to have in your mind in this, that God has given us a call. He's given us a mission, a, a course to fulfill, and Satan is going to do his best to stop it. And so when he attacks you, when he intimidates you, when he tries to get you to move from your position or to give up, what are you to do? It tells you right there in verse 13, you're to stand. No, I am not going to be shaken. You see, it's this emphasis that is so plain in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11 and verse 13. Should we just read that again? Look at the emphasis on standing. Look at it there. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Now look at verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Should I pile on a little more? Look at verse 14. Stand, therefore. And I think he even continues it on even more. Well, you get the point there. The whole idea here is that the emphasis of, of the goal, the effect, the, the purpose of the strength of God, the armor of God in our life is so that we would stand. We do the Lord's work and we stand against every hint of spiritual opposition. We're not going to give into it. We're not going to be intimidated by it. And we're not going to let it stop us. See, I would suggest to you that God gives the Christian a glorious standing to maintain by faith and in spiritual warfare. You, you just do, you get out your concordance. Nobody uses concordance anymore, right? Use the Bible search program on your computer, right? Fire up your computer, type in the search word stand or standing in the New Testament. And you're going to see some things that will surprise you. You'll see that we stand in grace that we stand in the gospel, that we stand in courage and strength, that we stand in faith, that we stand in Christian liberty, that we stand in Christian unity, that we stand in the Lord, that we stand perfect and complete in the will of God. Now, doesn't want to, Satan want to move you off of that standing? This is the place that God has given you to stand, to live, to, to live your life for him. I like the same idea. It's there repeated in 1 Peter chapter 5. Be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Listen, all in all, there's a lot wrapped up in that little five-letter word, stand. You know, I tell you, it means an awful lot there. It means, you know what it means? It means you're going to be attacked. Right? Soldier, stand your ground. Soldier, don't be moved. It's all vain if you're never going to be attacked. Oh, so when he tells you stand, you should expect that things will come along to shake you from that standing that you have. It means that we must not be frightened. If you're going to stand and hold your ground and fight the battle, you can't be frightened, can you? What do frightened people do? Do they stand? They run. He didn't say run, he said stand. It must mean as well, that we must not droop or slouch. We're not uncertain or half-hearted in the fight. We're, we're, we're not slouching. We're standing at attention. That's a call to a military man. You're ready to fight, right? Soldier, get up off of your bed. Get out of your lazy boy recliner. Get busy with the work. It means that we're at our position and alert, and it means that we don't even give a thought to retreat. There's the command to that soldier, right? You stand your ground, right? And what does he say? He goes, I'm not moving back. I don't give a thought to retreat. So this is what we do. Verse 14, 
stand, therefore. Now he gets into the great passage of the spiritual armor. And I want you to understand, when he talks about the spiritual armor in the following verses, he divides it into two categories. I don't know if you ever noticed this before, but look at it there. He divides it into two categories. There's the spiritual armor to have, and there's the spiritual armor to take. I'll explain the difference between the two, but verses 14 and 15 describe the spiritual armor that we're to have. Look at it there. He says, Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with the truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You, you can only stand when you're equipped with the armor uh, that God has given us in Jesus Christ. Every aspect of this symbolic armor answers to a specific dynamic in the Christian life that enables us to stand against spiritual attack. Now, you, you may have heard, and I think it's a wonderful idea, that Paul wrote this letter when he was in the custody of Roman soldiers. It was easy for him to look at the equipment of the guards who guarded him and say, you know what, God has equipped the believer just like that. You know, that, that, that soldier has a belt that he has, and it's very important to his equipment. The believer has something like that in their life. The, the, that soldier has a breastplate, very important to that soldier. The believer has something like that. I, I can just see this, how Paul is looking at this, and maybe he's meditating on that passage from Isaiah 59 that we looked at before, and he looks at the Roman soldier and he goes, man, that's it. Look at how that's just like the Christian life. By the way, the order that he lists them here, this is the order in which a Roman soldier would ordinarily put these things on. So it's almost like Paul's watching a Roman soldier get himself dressed. And he goes, that's it, that's it, that's it. And he just thinks and he makes the analogy each step of the way. So first of all, having your girded your waist with truth. Truth is symbolically represented as a belt which protects your abdomen but also it gathers up your garments so that you can fight effectively. Look, you know, I know we like to think of, of the Romans in these nice little short skirts that they wear, you know, kind of look like a cheerleader skirt or something that they would wear. No, typically people, I'm not saying nobody dressed like that, but I think the common man didn't dress like that. That was fancy clothes. The common man wore this kind of long flowing robe kind of thing. And this long flowing robe, it would get in the way when you were ready to fight. So what would you do? You'd gather it up, you'd kind of fold it up around you, and you'd tie it all up with a belt. It meant that your legs were free to fight. It was, meant you weren't trying to fight a battle in a wedding dress. And so you, you don't have this long flowing thing. It's tied up. It's ready to go. And you're ready to fight. I think it's interesting. The belt, strictly speaking, the belt is not part of the armor, right? You don't think belt, armor, not really. But yet, before the armor can be put on, the garments underneath have to be gathered together. And so you, you could make the argument, the belt isn't really part of the armor officially. But if you don't have it, nothing else in the armor works. And by the way, when a man sat down and relaxed, when the soldier was off duty, what did he do? He took off his belt, right? That, that was almost his way of saying, I'm off duty, right? I'm not ready to fight. The belt's uncomfortable. It bunches up the garments in an uncomfortable way. It's good for fighting, but, but it's not good for relaxing. So when I'm off duty, I take off the belt. What does Paul say? When is it off duty for a Christian? Like never. You put it on, the belt of truth, all the time. This belt of truth puts on the biblical beliefs of the Christians as a whole. In other words, what other passages call the faith. Many people believe that, that the church will never go forward unless it takes off its belt of truth, right? That's the way for the church to go forward. You can't be so dogmatic. You, you, oh, you, you move off those doctrines. People don't want to hear doctrine. Just tell them other things. Entertain them today. That's what they want. They're saying to the church, if you want to go forward, take off the belt of truth. No way. you got to have it. By the way, this is armor to have. You know what that means? You have it on all the time. You have it on all the time, the belt of truth. Next, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness is represented as a breastplate which provides essential protection for the most vital organs. We can no sooner battle effectively against spiritual enemies in our own righteousness than a soldier could effectively fight without his breastplate. And so here, that's how important the breastplate is. You better have it on and have it all the time. 
Next, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The, the preparation of the gospel is represented as the protective shoes or sandals that were worn, worn by Roman soldiers. You, you can't fight effectively or go about your business without this kind of equipment. And so he says, you have to have this prepared foundation, the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. By the way, Roman armies were famous for their shoes. They were famous because they knew how to equip their soldiers with shoes made out of thick leather and metal studs or sharp nails. They could have a great grip. And so they said, listen, you've got to be prepared. You've got to be ready. This is what you need in the spiritual battle. You, you, you need to gird your, your waist with truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. But now in verse 16, he speaks about another aspect of the armor. The armor to take. Notice this. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, when he says above all in verse 16, the real idea there is in addition to the previous. He's not trying to say this armor is more important than what I just mentioned. No, the idea really there is, okay, you have these three things. You have the belt, the breastplate, and the shoes. You have that. Now, put on these other things where he says, taking the shield of faith. Now, I think this is very, very interesting. The idea when he says, taking the shield of faith, is that this is the armor that you pick up at the needful moment. The, the have armor you have on all the time. Always in the truth always in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, always furthering the gospel of the preparation of peace, always. That's, that's your standing condition. This other armor, you pick it up at the opportune moment. You pick it up when you need it. You take the shield of faith. Now, may I emphasize, having comes before taking, right? I think there's some Christians, they're trying to take up that shield of faith. Man, you don't even got the breastplate on. You don't have the belt of truth on. No, have first. Having comes first, then taking. So at that needful moment, take the shield of faith. you, you got to be rooted in the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and the combat boots of the gospel, then take it. i got to think, there's, there's certainly those demanding moments in spiritual warfare, aren't there? You know what that's like, right? There's a normal life, everything's okay, yeah, right? I've got, I got you know, the belt of truth on, I'm living and walking in the truth. Breastplate of righteousness, oh Lord, my righteousness is in Jesus Christ, it's not in me. I got that breastplate on. The, the gospel of preparation peace, man, I know the gospel and I want to spread it wherever I can. Great, you got all that, and then boom, something will happen where you got to fight at that opportune moment, right? The, the, a flood of depression or discouragement comes upon you. It feels like a black cloud, right? Isn't that a time when you got to take up some armor? A, a relatively insignificant thing gets blown way out of proportion. Do you know what that is, right? And it should be nothing. But for some reason, life and death seems to cling to this insignificant thing. You have an opportunity to speak with somebody about what Jesus did for you. That's a moment of spiritual warfare, isn't it? You, you, you have opposition against the sense that God wants you to do something or to follow through and see this is you know God wants you to do it, but you don't want to do it. That's a moment of spiritual warfare. Or you just have this sense of panic or helplessness. In those critical moments, we need to take the shield of faith. We need to take the helmet of salvation. We need to take the sword of God's word. So do you see the difference here between having and taking? Now, faith here is represented as a shield. It protects us from all the fiery darts of the wicked one, Th those persistent efforts of demonic foes to weaken us through fear and unbelief. When Paul speaks about a, a shield here, uh, the Romans used several different kinds of shields. He's not speaking of a small, round shield. He's speaking of the long, oblong shield that could protect the whole body. And these fiery darts would be launched by the enemy. They were actually flaming arrows that were shot at the beginning of an attack. The idea when these flaming arrows were shot is that they would go over and not only would they injure or kill some of the, the enemy, 
But the flaming arrows would spread panic, right? Oh, how would you feel? You know, a thousand flaming arrows come hurtling into your position, and the guy right next to you just gets a flaming arrow right into his chest or in a crease in his arm or something, and you just got one stuck in your shield. You'd be tempted to panic, wouldn't you? No, that's when you need to stand. That's when you... The shield of faith will protect me at that moment. All those thoughts, all those feelings, all those fears, all those lies, all of them can be hurled at us by Satan as if they were fiery darts. Faith turns them back. You just believe in Jesus Christ. Don't believe in yourself. Well, that's a pretty lame shield of faith, isn't it? It's like going out there and you're fighting this battle and there's your shield. It's made out of cardboard or tissue paper or something like that. Yes, you know, that's what your faith, faith in yourself is like. But faith in Jesus Christ? Oh, you, we need to just grow up in this and realize the attack is there and we're, we're going to be bold and we're not going to give up on it. Not to panic in that moment of attack. You know, my favorite story of all time about not panicking has to do, as you might imagine, with, with Martin Luther. It's said of him one day that he woke up in a, one day, one evening, you know, where he woke up in the middle of the night and he could just feel the hot breath of Satan on his neck. And, and you know, he just knew, oh man, the devil is in the room and the devil wants to tear me to pieces. And he could just feel this, this dark spiritual oppression, this demonic force filling the room. And so he sat up in his bed and he said, oh, it's you again. And then he went and slept. <laughs> it's like, oh, so what? Do whatever you want, Satan. You can't touch me. I'm a child of God. I have faith. You know, now, now, the faith that looks at yourself would immediately, well, am I strong enough to face this attack? Am I, am I, can I, am I up to this? Can I do this? Forget about yourself. Your faith is in Jesus Christ. There you just lift up the shield of faith. It's faith in Jesus and what he can do for you. It's like the old thing, when the devil comes knocking at the door, just send Jesus to answer the door, right? Don't try to go and argue with it yourself. Well, that's the shield of faith. Then the helmet of salvation. And in the ancient world, Usually, the helmet was a leather cap that was studded with metal for extra strength. Oftentimes, they would put some kind of feather or something like that on to identify the soldiers within a group. And so he says, salvation is like a kind of helmet. It protects the essential material inside of your head. You know, I've got to say, when, when Satan comes against us and one of his most effective weapons is discouragement... Man, you got that helmet of salvation on. You you just know that you can stand against the discouragement. You know you're equipped. Hey, listen, devil, whatever you say, I'm saved. Right? I'm going to heaven. You're going to hell. That's all I know. For I, I, the rest of it, you can figure out. But I'm saved. What a source of strength in that moment of spiritual warfare and confusion. And then he speaks here about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The idea is that the Spirit provides a sword for you, and the sword is the word of God. So to effectively use the sword of the Spirit, you, you, you've got to fight with it in the spiritual way. We, we don't regard the Bible as a book of magic charms or, or that you, you tie a Bible around your neck to, to ward off the devil, you know, like garlic is supposed to ward off a vampire. You know, you don't shake the book at the devil, you know. No, it's your understanding, it's your apprehension, it's your faith in the book. You see, to effectively use that sword, you've got to regard it as the word of God. Notice it, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. If you're not confident in the inspiration of scripture, then you, you did this sword come to the spirit or not? I, is this the sword of Paul? The sword of Paul is not going to help you that much. No, maybe this is the sword of Jeremiah. I'm not sure. Forget, forget. Give me the sword of the spirit. The one that comes from the word of God. But he gave us this idea, and you just think of you think of a soldier, you think of a of a gladiator in training, and he has the sword. And what does he do? He's got this fight to fight, and 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 they, they put a sword in his hand for the very first time. What's he gonna do with it? Well, he's gonna be awkward with it, right? What does it take to effectively use a sword? Training. Experience. 
you know, and the, you see the gladiator gets a favorite sword, doesn't he? And he learns that sword inside and out. He knows how it's balanced. He knows how it feels. He knows how it reacts from a blow to the enemy. He knows everything. He practices the thrusts and the moves and the positions ahead of time. And, and he practices them if he's a superior fighter and has a great fighting instinct. At the moment that the battle fights, he just instantly recalls his moves, right? And the, he just knows the moves to make, which how he does it and everything. And it's just the perfect kind of moves at the perfect kind of moment because he's rehearsed it all ahead of time. He'll never have, excuse me, he'll never be able to use that, that thrust in the fight if he hadn't practiced it before in practice. Well, this is what you have to do with your knowledge of the Bible, right? Well, you, you know it's bad, right? You know it's bad when you're in the situation, you go, Oh, I have a really bad spiritual problem. I better start looking in the Bible to see what can help me. Now look, it's better to look in the Bible than anywhere else. But where do we need to get to in our Christian life? We need to get to in our Christian life where we're so familiar with this book that when we're in that bad spiritual problem, we instantly begin to recall the relevant biblical passages and principles. Instead of trying to search for it at the moment, which, listen, is better than not searching for it at all. I'm not trying to discourage anybody from that. But you need to be like that trained gladiator, that trained soldier, right? Where when you're going into the battle, it's not the first time you've ever held that sword. You know what you're doing. Well, in verse 18, we come back to this passage that I think is very, very important. Where he tells us what to do with the spiritual strength in the armor of God. Notice it here, verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints and for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. You know, I... I just have to say, I love this passage because Paul has spoken to us with such power, with such vivid imagery about this battle that we're supposed to fight, about the warfare that we're supposed to have. And we just read and we go, yes, you know, you're, you're all excited now, right? Yeah, I got to fight. What am I going to do? Let me at him, Lord. Come on, I'm ready. You know, you think, yes, send me in there. And then what is it? Now, what do you do? You know, we're all excited. He says, pray. Now, for some of us, that's a letdown, right? Oh, oh, well, I thought I was going to get to do something fun with this armor, right? I, I, yeah, I go out and, no, pray. That's what you're supposed to do. Matter of fact, he says, praying always with all prayer. The idea there is all kinds of prayer or prayer upon prayer. Use every kind of prayer you can think of. When you're in the spiritual battle, use group prayer. Use individual prayer, use silent prayer, use shouting prayer, use walking prayer, use kneeling prayer, use eloquent prayer, use groaning prayer, use constant prayer, use fervent prayer. Just pray. Use everything you have. Listen, you better go through every tool in your toolbox, right? The, the water's leaking. The pipe's busted. It's crisis time. You just don't go, oh, well, there's one tool. Oh, I guess that doesn't work. Well, I nothing to do now. What do you, you rummage through every tool in your toolbox. What can I use to fix this? You pray with all kinds of prayer. And I have to say from this principle, the way that Paul structures this, the way that, that it all feeds into verse 18, you have to say that it's through prayer that spiritual strength and the armor of God go into work. Now, I, I picture this. I have this picture in my mind. It's a weird picture. I picture a strong Christian, strong in the Lord, right? Like a bodybuilder, right? Muscles everywhere. He's strong in the Lord. And then I picture him totally outfitted with the armor, right? Just the most fearsome soldier you ever saw, strong, mightily equipped. But he never prays. And the devil just laughs. What good is it, right? Here you are, Mr. Strong, perfect soldier. There you are, just the perfect soldier. And you never put it into action by prayer. You see, often, we, we don't pray because we're simply overconfident in our own abilities. No, but prayer is the way that we do it. And I love it how he puts it here in verse 18. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and all supplication. He just prayer upon prayer upon prayer. Notice what he says at the end of verse 18, for all the saints. 
You know what that tells you? You can battle spiritually, not only on your own behalf, but on behalf of others. But isn't that how it works in the army, right? You don't say, well, he's not attacking me. You know, people right and left to you, they're getting cut down by the enemy. Well, he's not hurting me. I don't have any problem with him. You don't think that way, do you? That's my buddy. That's my pal. We're in this together. And so if they're shot down, man, my heart is into it just as much as if I was hit, probably even more. No, there's an instinct to protect and to battle on behalf of others. And then you've got to love how Paul does this in verse 19. I've told you all this about spiritual warfare, all about the strength of God, all about the armor of God, all about putting it into action and prayer. And then he comes into verse 19. Oh, yeah, can you pray for me, he says? You know, as long as I've got you all pumped up, as long as I've got you praying, pray for me, please. Pray for me that everything would be easy and comfortable in my life. Is that what Paul asked for? Right? Pray, pray for me. I'd be lots of money and lots of comfortable times. No, look at it, verse 19. And for me, what was on Paul's heart? That utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Paul knew that he was going to get the opportunity to stand before Caesar and proclaim the truth. And he said, listen, I need every spiritual warrior at my back, both before, during, and after that moment to make the most of that effective moment. And I think that as Paul stood there before Caesar, he knew that the Ephesians were praying for him, that the Philippians, that the Colossians, that all his Christian friends around him, that they were like a great army of prayer making this effective assault. And then he says, I love this verse in verse 20. He says, for which I am an ambassador in chains. There's a wonderful word play that he uses there, ambassador in chains. The ancient Greek word for chains, of course, could mean a prisoner's shackles, right? And Paul could have been chained when he was writing this, right? He had chains on himself, or at least at night, probably he was chained, if not through the day. But that word for chain could also be used for the gold adornment that was worn around the neck and the wrists of the wealthy and powerful. On special occasions, ambassadors wore these chains to show the riches and the power and the dignity of the government that they represented. You know, just the big gold jewelry, you know, just all decked out with it. And Paul's thinking, I'm an ambassador. And he holds up his chains. These are my chains of glory. Paul, they're not gold. They don't look nice. But if you knew my Lord, you knew that these are the chains of glory. Paul considered his prisoners' chains to actually be the glorious adornment of an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Well, verse 21, now we come to the very end of the book. He says, but that you may also know my affairs and how I'm doing. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. Well, apparently Tychicus, he was a mention, an associate of Paul's, I should say, mentioned in others' letters. Acts chapter 20 mentions him, Colossians chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, Titus chapter 3. He seems to have often been used by Paul as a messenger. So, so the letter was written, it was given to Tychicus, and he's the one who carried it to the Ephesians, and then it said that he may comfort your hearts. I, I just picture it in my mind. I might be wrong, but I think you think I'm right. Don't you picture Tychicus giving everybody a big hug from Paul, right? Oh, well, Paul wanted me to give you a hug, and you a hug, and everybody's hearts comforted, right, because they know Paul loves them. And finally, verses 23 and 24. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Well, Paul concludes the letter just like he began it, with reference to grace and peace, these two essential cornerstones for the Christian life. And he says, listen, a blessing, all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity, without corruption, with an undying love, blessing upon them. And then he ends the letter with pronouncing a blessing. Now, isn't this a little interesting how Paul ends this letter? In other words, don't you remember in some of his other letters, it's, hey, greet this person, say hi to them. This person says hi. There's all these personal connections and interactions. 
there's really hardly any of this. At the end, there's only one guy mentioned, and that's Tychicus, but he was the guy carrying the letter. Do you remember what I told you at the very beginning of our study in Ephesians? I said that some ancient manuscripts, just a few, I don't want to exaggerate, it's just a couple of them, but in a couple ancient manuscripts where it says, to the church at Ephesus, there's a blank space. Some people think that Paul deliberately wrote this not just to be to one congregation, but to be a letter that got spread about to a lot of different congregations. And I am inclined to believe that because at the end, he doesn't have a lot of personal connections, right? If it was going to just one church where he knew a lot of people, well, sure, I'll I'll mention a lot of people I know. But if he said, man, this is going to get spread all over. And in Colossae, they won't know the people in Ephesus. And in Ephesus, they won't know the people in Philippi. And I want this letter to spread. And it's no wonder he wanted it to spread. You know, when you think of the glory of this letter from the beginning to the end, all that it tells us about who we are in Jesus Christ and all that God has done for our redemption and restoration, and then all that he's given us to walk this Christian life, and as we've seen tonight, to fight this Christian combat, you realize this isn't a letter to the Ephesians so much as it's a letter to you and I. It's for us. So it's wonderful. Grace be with those who love our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul ends by pronouncing a blessing. It was his way of helping the Ephesians to walk in every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. That's our property. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this amazing letter to the Ephesians. And Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom and ability in the spiritual warfare that we fight. Lord, I pray that you would help us to set an agenda for our Christian life, to step forward boldly, to live for you, to walk for you in whatever calling or arena you give us. Lord, I pray that every time that Satan or his minions try to set us aside from that purpose, that we would boldly fight off every hindrance and that we would stand and that we'd further the work of your gospel. Especially, Lord, Show us how to gather your strength, how to wear your armor, and how to put it all into practice by prayer. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We can't read these amazing passages without praising you for your love and your goodness to us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.